don't mind me, I'm just admiring the work here and my tomato and pepper kingdom. This is going to be the year that I grow the most tomatoes and peppers and heat loving vegetables that I ever have. And it's thanks to this, this polycrub. It is a greenhouse polytunnel hybrid. We finished works on building the structure about six weeks ago. And now look, we have the very first bed in. And this bed and this entire structure is going to allow me to grow so many more vegetables because we live in a quite cool climate. We have lots of storms. This is the perfect structure for us. And I just cannot wait to see how productive it's going to be in the years to come. Now, today I'm going to cover how we built this first bed, including the structure itself the fill and how I planted it up. And I'm sure that it will help you regardless of whether or not you're building raised beds in a polycrub or polytunnel or out in the garden. And I've learned a couple of new things as well, which I'm putting into practice with these new beds. Other people who have polytunnels and even large greenhouses and even polycrubs opt to grow in the ground. And if you have really good soil, that is an excellent option. You don't have to build any fancy beds. You can just either use no dig or dig it over and just grow directly in the soil inside your structure. But when we were building the polycrub, we had to level the ground slightly, but also dig down for the foundations of the supporting hoops. And what we found is that underneath here, it is hardcore. It was obviously put in to create a flat surface, being that we are on a slope. So in the past they did that, but it makes the ground really rocky. It's filled with bricks and rubble and uh, slates, just all kinds of stuff and is really, really not suitable for growing most plants in, especially not vegetables and fruit. And so deciding on building raised beds inside here was a no brainer. But with raised beds, there are lots of things to consider. The type of wood, the size of it, how you construct it, and ways to make sure that the beds last a long time. of the beds are completed as far as the structure, the wooden part. And if you look really closely down the middle, there's a faint outline of flower. And that is where the third one is going to go. But we've just put two in for now because we figured it would be easier to get these built and filled. And then we can tackle the middle one. And in the meantime, we can use all of this space to work and, and get the wheelbarrow in and, and all of that. The structure of the beds is just long, rectangular, and open. There are supports down the center. And Josh built these both on his own. I did very little to help. I'm very lucky to have him and his amazing woodworking skills. And the length of these is 17 foot 9 inches roundabout. It's 5.42 meters and the height of them is 18 inches. It's three planks high. And then down the middle, there are these rectangular supports. The purpose of these is to keep the sides from bowing out because when this is filled with soil and plants, the wood would begin to bow out at the sides. And so this will help to stop that from happening. Choosing the right wood for your raised beds is pretty important. You want it to last a long time, you want it to be safe for food and the soil, and you want it to look good as well. I've chosen 
these pressure treated planks for a few reasons. Pressure treated wood is resistant to rot, it's resistant to insects, it lasts longer and also because I do not have a supply of redwood planks or other types of anti-fungi, anti-insect hardwood to choose here on the Isle of Man. If you do, go for it. They're quite a bit more expensive, but they're naturally resistant to that. Now also, thickness of planks. The thickness matters because if you choose planks that are too thin, they can be affected a lot quicker by weather, by rot, by insects. Again, so these are 47 millimeters thick. So that's just under two inches thick. And these are a good solid thick board. Building is sometimes not as simple as just throwing a bunch of wood together. You've got to think about the construction, make sure it's going to be strong and last a long time. And so uh, choosing the right wood, choosing the right screws, those are the natural first steps. And Josh spent two afternoons putting these two beds together. So one afternoon each, and he's built them in the center and then moved them over into their final positions. They're really heavy. I did help him with moving, especially since he thought we needed to fill in the side over here with some bricks and stones just to lift it up a bit. So we shunted it aside and then moved it back. They are now where they're going to live. And the next step is something that I've never done before, but something that I've learned from a friend, Deanna, at Homestead and Chill. She's got a YouTube channel and a website as well. She's also in the first chapter of my book. So if you have a, a copy of A Woman's Garden, flip to the first chapter and you'll see her first garden. And she has recently put together some new raised beds. And a friend of hers who's been installing raised beds for 30 years in the Bay Area told her a few tips and tricks about prolonging the life of raised beds. And the one that has me most excited is using silicon sealants between all of the cracks. And apparently this one step can help to prolong the, li the lifespan of your raised beds by double. And so if you're hoping, expecting your beds to last eight, 10 years, 16, 20 years, it doesn't, it doesn't sound too bad considering the price of timber these days. I spoke with her privately about the type of silicon and she uses standard silicon for exterior use and that was what was recommended to her. And when that dries and cures, it's inert and there's not supposed to be any kind of leaching. She says that it's pretty safe. But just to be on the safe side, I did a little bit more uh, further research and a lot of the silicon is made with a fungicide to be in the silicon and that's just to stop black mold from forming, especially in clear silicon. When you think about it in bathrooms and kitchens, the, the little black spots behind there. And it's not supposed to leach, but I found this stuff, which is aquarium uh, sealant. So it's silicon for using on aquariums and any kind of living situation where there's glass or PVC. So for reptiles, fish, and it doesn't have any fungicide in it and it doesn't have any solvents in it. It wasn't quite clear whether or not it worked on wood, but I've tried it on this bed over the weekend and it's in there, it's stuck in good, and I'm pretty confident that this is gonna work. And again, it, it's even safer. There's not gonna be anything in there that will kill aquatic life, that will harm your soil, that will harm other animals. And it has sealed this really tightly. So not only is it sealing all of those crevices and cracks where rot and moisture can get in and start the degradation of your beds, but I also had a thought, it's also sealing moisture into the bed and raised beds lose moisture a lot quicker than an in-soil solution. And so I'm really excited about this. And if you want to find aquarium sealant, you can look online. I imagine some pet shops might have it, larger ones, and it goes on pretty easily. So I've finished this bed over here. It took me an hour to fill in all of the cracks here, maybe a little bit more than an hour. And so today I'm going to be sealing up this bed 
before I start filling this one so that by tomorrow, this one will be ready to take compost and soil and everything else I'm putting in it. It's not that difficult to do the siliconing, although it does take a bit of time. And it will take about two tubes of the silicon for me to completely seal each bed. That's what I found with the first one. And so I've got six of these for all three beds and I've got a silicon gun, which I've absolutely covered in silicon in the last, in the last bed. And you just fit it in and then you'll have to pump it a couple of times to get it all tight. And then you do a line of silicon like that and you can either use your finger to squish it in or a piece of wood like this and just get that excess silicon off and squeeze that silicon into the crack. Get it in as much as you can because it's not doing any good outside of the crack. And then you can take whatever's excess and squish it in someplace else. And that way you get the most for your silicon. And that's pretty much it. Some of these take 30 minutes to dry. Some of them need a full day. I think probably it's a safer bet to wait a full day for it to cure before you start filling the beds with soil and compost and water and all of that just to make sure that this is fully dried and it's not going to come off. And then you just fill it in. Wherever you see a crack, put some silicon, squish it in, use your fingers, don't touch your clothes, and then just leave it to dry. do you fill a raised bed? Now, <laughs> depending on who you ask and what their gardening philosophy is, you can get so many different answers. And there are lots of ways to fill them and they can be successful. But one thing to watch out for is using too much topsoil in these beds. If you have a shorter raised bed that's in the ground, it can sometimes work and I've seen people do that but you do have to use a lot more water because soil is essentially crushed minerals and rock. It is not moisture retentive. So what you do need is materials that will help bulk it out, hold on to moisture, release nutrients, and create a really nice growing medium for plants. And so that is why I've used a mixture of soil from the garden that we've just taken from here, this exact site, We've also added compost and we didn't have enough, so we had to bring that in. I'll get to that in a second. And we used a third ingredient that is going to improve the structure, improve aeration, and also hold on to nutrients and slow release them. And that material is vermiculite. Vermiculite is a naturally occurring mineral and it's pH neutral, so it's inert, it's sterile, it can absorb three to four times its own weight in water. It attracts and holds on to minerals and nutrients, slow releases them. And the structure of it actually creates air pockets and aids in draining. It is such a great material. And so that is why I've included vermiculite as one of the materials in these beds. And as I'm sitting here looking at it, the pieces are actually quite large. Vermiculite is sold in garden centers, but it can be quite expensive there. And it's a very fine material. I use it all the time with starting off seeds and propagation. But if you go to a building suppliers or especially plumbers or chimney suppliers, so the materials that those tradespeople use, you can get big bags of vermiculite for a lot less. So a small bag of vermiculite is probably about 16 pounds at the garden center. A big bag cost me 27.50. And the pieces will break down a little bit, they'll flake off, but they will stay in this form. They don't degrade over time and they will help improve that structure and add so much more to it that the compost and the soil just cannot. 
I used one bag of vermiculite for this bed. So one bag, seven kilograms of vermiculite. Aside from that, I did have to buy in compost. I make compost, but not nearly the amount needed to fill these beds. There is a lot in here. There's a lot of volume. And so I ordered organic peat-free compost from a local supplier, a couple of guys that I know who make it using green waste and manure from equestrian centers, and they make a really good product. And so they had that delivered here and it is just really, really good stuff. I also used soil, so topsoil. And I think a lot of people, when you're building beds and you want to use soil, you'll have to order it in. Now, fortunately, when we were building the polycrub, we were reducing this bank back behind here, taking out a, a bit of the lower, kind of slightly raised area, that chunk, and we, so we have a lot of topsoil left over. But unfortunately, it's very stony, there are weed roots in it, and also it's clay. So there's big chunks of clay in there as well. So I really wanted to use this soil, but it has so many issues. It would need to be screened in order to be used in these beds and screening by hand. So having a screen and actually sifting the soil through, it would be an incredible effort. And so I did a little bit of research and I found out that there are these things called electric rotary sieves, soil sieves. And I looked around, um, they are available in other places off the Isle of Man relatively easily, but not really locally. And so I started inquiring around. And fortunately, the guys at Manx Muck who brought the compost, they had a spare one that they weren't using at the back of one of their barns. They bought it with the intention of using it for their business, but they actually got a modern one instead. So it's an antique, it is heavy, and it's the reason that Josh got sciatica because he single-handedly pulled it up through the garden and set it up back behind the house, and he fell during that, and it really, it really scared me seeing him fall. He is fine now, the sciatica is fine, it's gone. There's slight numbness in his foot. And so he was able to help me this week in sifting the soil through it and filling these beds. So this is how it works. I've loaded about six spadefuls of soil back there. Switch it on. As it turns, the soil, the sift soil falls down here. pieces like stones and clods of clay they come down here and I'm catching them in an old fish box. To fill this bed it took 42 wheelbarrow loads of sieved soil and compost and it's a 50-50 mix there that I tried to mix together with a garden fork after we dumped it inside the raised bed. And then of course, a bag of vermiculite, so seven kilogram bag of vermiculite. I think that the vermiculite is about five to 10% of the mix. And then the rest is the compost and the soil. Now to fill this and to build the bed, it took about two and a half days. We're talking full days. And that was either Josh and I working at the same time or Josh building the bed or me spending time siliconing it. It took a lot of effort, but we want to do this right. We want to create beds that are going to last a long time that are really deep for plant roots. I don't want to put too much stuff down below. I definitely don't want to put logs or wood or anything like that because at least in my climate, I really fear that that would cause a lot of problems with slugs and other insects down inside the beds, ants and things like that. And so we wanted nice soil, nice beds. This is an investment in our food future, which I will say again and again. And if you start off on the right foot, you do things right, then you don't have to do it over again. You know, that saying, buy cheap, buy twice, it, the same thing goes with gardening. So know what you're doing, do it well, and your efforts will reward you.
Yesterday was such a hard day of filling this bed. Literally all day we worked in sieving the soil, moving in wheelbarrow loads of compost, me digging it all together. Oh, it was exhausting. But at the end, we had this beautiful completed filled bed and I couldn't just leave it empty. And so I planted the very first tomatoes and peppers and I've also even squeezed in some basil basil and you'll see at the back that there are three different tomato plants per section so there's nine in total they're about two feet apart and then in front of them I've put peppers and they're various different types now before planting though I needed to put in supports tomatoes these are indeterminate tomatoes so they'll grow and grow and grow they'll keep growing as long as you let them really and as long as there's vertical space and so they are going to be trained on strings and I, I've used strings for many years now to grow my tomatoes on and it works really well in a greenhouse scenario but they do need something to be tied to at the top and so what we found is that with the polycrub we could just put bamboo stakes so the bamboo canes in between the black round supports and they were supported on one side by one of the wooden beams and that's great because we could just slide them in there and then we can take them out when we need to so they're not in there they're not permanent and they are really sturdy and so I tied string to them at the top strung it down cut it and I've buried the string inside the planting hole with each of the tomatoes and then after I've filled it back in, I've started weaving them around the string. Planting the peppers is really straightforward. You just plant them to the surface that they're growing inside their pots and that's it. The tomatoes are a bit different and they can grow roots from anywhere along their stem and that is such a great thing because if you plant them deeper then they can grow roots extra roots have access to moisture and nutrients much further down in the ground or in the raised bed and if you're planting your tomatoes outside it gives them more stability against wind if you can allow them to be a little bit deeper and have more roots and so i've planted these about six inches deeper than they were in the pot and as they grow i'll wind them around the string and i'll pinch out the little growing points these little sprouts at the joints between their leaves and their stem and i'll also reduce the amount of leaves just down here below about this point here so i'll give them a good 18 inches or more of leaf free stem and that will allow a bit more space for the peppers and anything else to grow here in the bed so next steps well we obviously need to fill this other bed that's completed and ready to go and then josh is going to build the center bed here and i'm going to silicone it we're going to cure it and then fill it and plant both of them up and i'm hoping it will take a further three days work to complete i know it seems like a lot but this is an investment in our food future and these are going to be so productive for many, many years to come. Now, if you have any questions whatsoever about the build, the materials, about the polycrub, leave your questions and comments as a comment down below. And lastly, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. In fact, I've just started up Patreon and it's a way for you to be able to directly support the channel and get kind of exclusive insider content as well and I'd like to say thank you especially to Suzanne and Yeti who is my first Patreon supporter and you can learn more about how to get involved and uh, be part of the Patreon family at the link down below in the video description. Thank you so much for watching and you'll see me here next week with another video on Lovely Greens. Bye for now.